Well, aren't you glad that Jesus is here? He is present. He's an ever, uh, you know, living hope in times of trouble. And, you know, I'm so glad that we're able to connect digitally. Are you thankful for that? I know I am. Uh, in fact, I encourage you, just comment in the comment sections. And it's a way that we know that you're there. I'm so happy that we can connect this way. But I got to tell you, I am really looking forward to getting everybody back together again. I'm really looking forward to that. You know, there really is no substitute for the face-to-face -face interaction. In fact, it tells us that God came and he made his dwelling among us. God didn't relate to us virtually. God came and dwelt among us. And you know, as we gather, uh, rather, you, you know, whether you're gathering here in the room with us, thank you, breakfast team, worship team, those that come and help us, you know, the skeleton crew to do what we do here, or whether you're gathering digitally, uh, you know, in your living room, or who knows, maybe you're still laying in bed in your pajamas and you're tuning in right now. No matter how you are, no matter how we're gathering, it's important we understand this is not to pay homage to a dead man. The reason we gather is because Jesus rose from the dead and we are here to celebrate that he is still moving among his people and changing lives. You know, after the resurrection, after Jesus rose from the dead, as you're reading through the, the Gospels, you see such a stark transformation in the lives of the disciples. And really what that boils down to is they had just laid eyes on a man whom they know had been crucified, put in a, put in a tomb, and now they see him alive and well. That'll be a game changer for you. And in fact, that you know, laying eyes on a resurrected Lord brought such transformation to these guys that it literally moved them from a place of cowardless and timidity to being bold proclaimers of the gospel, regardless of the threat. Uh, in fact, that's the way they approached it for the remainder of their lives. Even though there was threat of to life, uh, persecution, you know, danger, um, all kinds of things that they faced. In fact, history tells us that pretty much all but one of the apostles died a martyr's death for their faith. Think about that. What, what moved them from this place of being cowards where they're hiding behind locked doors in fear of the Jews one moment to now they're boldly proclaiming and willing to die? Well, one is they had laid eyes on the resurrected Lord. You know, for 40 days after Jesus' bodily resurrection, he was on the face of the earth teaching people. And it tells us that just as he was ready to ascend to heaven, he spoke these last words to the disciples. He had told them, and he instructed them. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And then he says something. He says, and I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. Why don't you turn to the person next to you and say, go ahead and say to them, God is with you always. He's always with us. He says, go everywhere and tell, every, tell everyone. So where is Jesus today? Well, we know that he ascended to heaven, so he's at the right hand of the Father. We know that through Scripture. We also know that Jesus is, uh, you know, part of the Godhead, and we know God is everywhere present, so he is everywhere. But we also know that when you say yes to Jesus, he comes and takes residence up in your life. He comes and lives in your life. And so you can have an encounter, your own personal encounter with this resurrected Lord, the presence, the person, and the power of this risen Lord isn't just out there, but he wants to come and reside in you. So here's the question. How do we encounter the presence and the power of this risen Lord? 
Well, the first key is this, is that you ask him into your life and you experience the infilling of the Holy Spirit. So before Jesus um, ascended to heaven, he had instructed the disciples. He told them to wait in Jerusalem. He says, I'm going to the Father, but don't you go anywhere. You wait in Jerusalem. Because in just a few days, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. This, that's exactly what he instructed them. He said, when the Holy Spirit comes, you will receive power. My power will, will come upon you, and you will become my witnesses. Witnesses to the whole world. So that's exactly what they did. So they're held up in the upper room with the doors locked and fear of the Jews. And a few days pass. And it says, suddenly there was the sound like the blowing of a violent wind that came and blew through that room where they gathered. And it says they saw what looked like these tongues of angel, uh, the, these tongues of fire that came and just settled on everybody's head. And it says all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other tongues as the Holy Spirit enabled them. I love the fact that it says all of them, virtually every one of them, was filled with the Holy Spirit. So we know that their encounter with the resurrected Lord certainly brought, you know, a, a, an altered perspective. But this encounter right here where the Holy Spirit and baptized them and filled them with the Holy Spirit, that was a game changer. That literal, literally transformed the lives of every one of them in that room, especially Peter. As you read in Acts 2, you, you can read the story there later today, but he goes out. He goes out into the crowd on the promenade there, and he begins to preach the gospel. He begins to preach about the fact that you guys had killed Jesus. You put him in a tomb, but he rose from the dead, and you must repent and give your lives to him. Now think about this. These are the very same people that days before had crucified Christ. And Peter was held up behind the locked door in fear that he may be next. So when he steps out into this crowd and he begins to preach, essentially he's really putting himself out there. He must think that possibly I will be the next one. And yet after laying eyes on a risen Lord, and being baptized in the Holy Spirit, he was filled with such a confidence that he was willing to face that risk. So he goes out, he preaches the gospel, and Scripture tells us that 3,000 people, more than 3,000 people, gave their lives to the Lord at that moment. Now what we call that day, that, that was kind of the birthing of the New Testament church. And we call that, that was the day of Pentecost, and we still can commemorate that. That's on your calendars. If you look ahead here in just a few days, you'll see there, there is a day of Pentecost, and that day commemorates the day that the baptism of the Holy Spirit was given to the church, to us, and the day that the church began. So before Jesus died, he told his followers, he told them, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. He says, I'm going to be going to the Father, but I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm not leaving you as orphans, but I will send the Helper. I will send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus says, I will be with you always, what is he talking about there? He's talking about the Holy Spirit. He's talking about his Spirit, the Holy Spirit of Jesus the Spirit of God coming and living inside of you. You know, if you've been in the church for any length of time, you've heard us talk about invite Jesus into your heart. So really, what's happening when you do that? Who really is coming into your heart is the Spirit of Christ. It's the Holy Spirit coming to live inside of you. Now, that's really good news because you know what that means? You're never alone. You know when you're in your car and that guy cuts you off and you're ready to have a few choice words with that guy? <laughs> Jesus is with you. <laughs> He's right there. You know when you're going through happy times? Jesus is there. When you're going through tough times. You may be going through a tough time 
right now. I know during this pandemic, there's some of you, maybe for the last six weeks, you've not even been out of your house. And you know, after a time of doing that, you can start to get into your own head. You can get depressed. Your emotions can feel pretty haggard. And I want you to understand completely that in those dark times, when you feel alone, when you feel isolated, that God is with you. He is with you right now. He's given you the Holy Spirit. If you've said yes to him, and the Holy Spirit is here, he's here right now. He's here to comfort you, to teach you, to guide you, to empower you. He's here to transform your life. We just need to recognize that and ask God, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit today. You know, a good way to start every morning when you get up and your feet hit the floor, just throw your hands in the air. Good morning, Holy Spirit. I just need to be filled afresh with you today. So one of the ways that we encounter the person and the presence of this resurrected Lord is by his Holy Spirit living inside of us. But you know, there's another way too. We encounter his presence through the coming together, the community of believers. And I, I happen to believe that even right now, you know, we may not be physically in the same room, but we're connecting virtually with heart to heart. We're hearing the same word. We're worshiping the same God. And I believe that in some way, God is knitting our hearts together. And he says this. He says, wherever two or more are gathered in my name, I am right there. I'm right in the midst, right in that place. You know, our worship is so important. And thank you, Alex and team. They always do such a tremendous job. The worship is so important because it rolls out a welcome mat. It rolls out the red carpet to invite his presence in. It says that God inhabits the praises of his people. The word inhabits, what does that mean? I looked it up. The word inhabit means the place where he dwells, the place where he resides, the place where he lives. So we know that God is everywhere. He's everywhere present. But did you know when we come together and we worship the Lord that he inhabits that place? He dwells in that place. And that's a beautiful thing. You know, when we come together, it's a kingdom party. God is throwing a party, and he invites us to it. And as we come to that party, he wants us to always remember that he is the guest of honor. See, we don't have to cross your fingers and hope that God will be here. You don't have to wonder, when is he finally going to show up? What we need to do is simply recognize God is here. And let's enter into his presence. Let's get in step with him. You encounter the person, the presence, and the power of this resurrected Lord when you invite the Holy Spirit to come and dwell in you and when we come together as a community of faith where two or more are gathered, he is there. What that means is right now, he's right here. He's in your house. He's with you right there on the couch right now. And my prayer this morning has been, as we worship, as I preach, as we talk about this, that you would sense something different in your home. That you would sense God is there. That he's comforting you. He's teaching you. He's empowering you. He's transforming you. You know, there's a third way that we experience the person and the presence and the power of this resurrected Lord. And it's when we look after and care for the broken among us. Those who are in a very difficult place. Those who are suffering. And you know, there's a passage in Matthew where at the judgment, this is what he's going to say to some. Let me read it for you. This is in Matthew chapter 25. It says, The king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom 
prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothing, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothing and give you clothes? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? Then the Lord, then the king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you've done unto the least of these, these brothers of mine, you've just done that unto me. I remember when Kelly and I had first got into ministry, we were junior high youth pastors. I'll tell you what, man, that was a lot of fun, leading junior hires. And we had a pretty good-sized group. And I remember a young man, his name was Phil. Phil was in our group. And I was teaching on this passage right here. And I didn't quite know how to help the junior high students understand what this was saying to us, but Phil gave me great material to work with. As he gets up, he leaves his seat. While he's gone, his friend Brian sits down in his seat. When Phil comes back, he grabs Brian by the arm and says, you're in my seat, <laughs> and throws him out. And everybody chuckles a little bit. And I paused for a moment. I said, Phil, you just threw Jesus out of this chair. And all of a sudden, it just hit him. It hit everybody. All those students, these 12-year-old kids, they realized, wow, that's how it works. How I treat others, that's exactly how I just treated Jesus. So when you communicate and show compassion to somebody else, Jesus receives it as if you've just shown compassion to him. When you've shown kindness to another human being, you just showed kindness to him. Now it's interesting because this can be taken positive or this can be taken negative. Here would be the negative. If you ignore another person, if you kick them to the curb, if it's within your means to help that person but you choose not to, then you've just essentially done that very same thing to Jesus. But he says, on the other hand, if you feed that person, if you care for them, if it's in your means to help, maybe it's just give some time, a word of encouragement, the Lord says, thank you, because you have just done that to me. One of my favorite uh, heroes in the faith, she's with the Lord now, was Mother Teresa. And Mother, Mother Teresa was a missionary to the uh, poor and the dying and the sick in Calcutta, India. And many people would come to sit and to learn from her. And on one particular occasion, here are some students, wealthy students, and they wanted to learn about her ministry, caring for the poor and the dying. And this is what she said to them. She said, when you see people on the street, and they're filled with disease. And their bodies are disfigured by sores. When they're covered with maggots. Reach out and touch them gently. With love. With care. Because right in a distressing disguise is Jesus. Whatever you do unto the least of these, you've done unto me. We don't need to go to Calcutta, India. You want to see Jesus? You can see him here on a Sunday morning with our breakfast ministry, disguised as a five-year-old homeless boy disguised as a woman with her hair all tattered. And you can care for Jesus 
right in that place. I have a friend uh, named Bruce, Bruce Arnold, and he is a hero in the faith. He pastors one of the most special churches in all of Portland. They don't meet in the building. He cares for all the homeless people downtown. He feeds them. He cares for them. He calls them all his friends. It's beautiful. You know, during this pandemic, there's been a real crisis down there. The agencies have been closed down. The uh, water fountains have been shut off. And here's homeless people wondering, how do I survive? And so the needs are significant. They're urgent. And so Bruce has reached out to the churches, including us. And he said, could your church help? And he's committed himself to every day he goes down there. And he distributes 125 lunches to his friends on the street because he believes Whatever you do unto the least of these, you've done unto me. And he gives them water, and he's reached out to us. He's asked, can you help? I need help with this. And so I know that Kelly has people. Um, people at home are putting sandwiches together. Um, we'll have a couple people coming in Tuesday and helping with this. And Bruce will pick that up. He'll take that and distribute that downtown. And it, I want you all to fully understand that I assure you that you're, as you are spreading peanut butter and as you're stuffing goodies into lunches, that it's Jesus himself that one day will look you in the eyes and he will say, thank you. And you'll say, thank you for what, Lord? He says, because when there was a time when I couldn't be fed on the streets because of a pandemic, you fed me. Whatever you do unto the least of these, you've done unto me. Do you want to encounter Jesus? Well, you're not going to find him in a robe or with a halo floating down the street. You encounter Jesus among the least of these. It's what motivates Gordon and Kathy for no reward, as we've continued to serve breakfast, and they're up in the middle of the night putting this together because they know, even though it may not be their hands that are handing it out, they know the Lord sees it all. And the Lord is saying, I was hungry, and you fed me. Whatever you do unto the least of these, you've done unto me. So how do we encounter the presence and the power of, of this risen Lord, three ways. One, you ask him into your life and the Holy Spirit comes and lives and dwells inside of you. He will teach you. He will comfort you. He will change you. We encounter his presence when the body of Christ comes together in worship. He is there. And lastly, we encounter his presence when we begin to care for the least of these. Because whatever you do unto the least of these, these brothers of mine, you have done it unto me. I'm going to ask if our worship team can come. And we're going to go ahead and worship together. But first I want to be able to pray with you. You know, if you don't know the Lord today, or maybe you need to recommit yourself to him, there's no time like the present. I'm going to pray, and would you let this prayer be your prayer? Dear Lord, I invite you to come into my life. I, I recognize what you did on that cross. That was the payment for my sin. Come in, forgive me of everything I've ever done, and fill me with your Holy Spirit that I may live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen.